Good evening. My name is Jan McBarish. I'm the Education and Events Director of the Free Speech Union. Welcome to all of those in the room uh, and to those of you joining online. Um, so tonight is the last in our series of three events on the theme of science, scepticism and free speech, uh, hosted in partnership with Sense About Science. Uh, you can watch the, the first two lectures which inform tonight's event on the Free Speech Union's YouTube channel. The first was, What is Science and Why Should We Care? And that was given by Professor Alan Sokal back in March. Alan's sitting here at the front tonight. Thanks for coming. Um, and the second lecture was given uh, last month by Professor Paul Garner, who's also here in the room, uh, and was titled, How We Learn to Question Medicine. Uh, between them, they've those videos have been watched uh, over 3,000 times. Uh, so go and have a look, see what people are saying underneath them. Feel free to comment as well. Uh, so we're really delighted and thank uh, Alan and Paul for the time they put into preparing those lectures, uh, coming along to both of them and then uh, coming along tonight as well. Um, so their lectures uh, did three very important things. Uh, first of all, I think they really clarified how the critical spirit is fundamental to science. Um, and it's a science's emergence, um, how that represented a, a historic transformation in the orientation of human society towards the world, both the natural world and the social world. Um, the lectures also offered us insights into how scientists experience the pressures upon them. Uh, some of them, the, the kind of ever-changing forces which threaten to dampen and distort open inquiry. And Alan took us right back to the, the very first kind of pressures on, sci on science. In its, as, as soon as it emerges, you pretty much get, uh, start to have pressure straight away. Uh, and then Paul took us all the way through to the more recent experiences that he's had very directly uh, to try to suppress evidence. Um, and then thirdly, the lectures have raised the democratic question, what the proper relationship should be between evidence and policy making, something that seems to be at the heart of so many social controversies in the last, uh, last few years. And that, I suppose, is really uh, one of the key questions for us to address tonight. So uh, to close the series, uh, tonight's discussion is called Science Under Pressure, Restoring Public Confidence. Uh, and so in this concluding conversation, our two speakers, Tracy Brown, the Director of Sense About Science, and Toby Young, General Secretary of the Free Speech Union and Editor-in-Chief of the Daily Skeptic, will reflect on the issues raised in those earlier lectures and debate how the relationship between science and the public might be improved. We can all sort of see what the problems are. Um, we probably come at them from very different perspectives. But um, what we need to be able to do is try to work out how to, how to move forward. So just to introduce our two speakers, I'm sure half the room will know uh, one speaker and half the room will know the other, perhaps. Um, so Tracy Brown OBE <laughs> is the director of Sense About Science, where she has turned the case for sci uh, sound evidence uh, and science into popular campaigns. Uh, including All Trials, a global campaign for the reporting of all clinical trial outcomes. She leads Sense About Science's work on transparency of decisions uh, to ensure the public has access to the same evidence as decision makers. Uh, this has included drafting the principles for the treatment of independent scientific advice and the transparency of evidence framework, now internationally emulated. In 2022, she led the What Counts inquiry and a national survey of the public's experience of public information during the pandemic, calling for all policy announcements to meet an evidence transparency standard. Uh, she's also uh, Honorary Professor of Science, Technology and Engineering in Public Policy at UCL. So can we welcome Tracy? I'm just going to introduce Toby, and then we'll... Um, sorry, that should have made that clearer. Uh, so Toby Young is speaking tonight while wearing two of his many hats. Um, uh, one is that of the General Secretary of the Free Speech Union. Uh, in the space of just four years, the FSU has grown to over 14,000 members, and over that town has um, handled over 2,500 cases in which uh, people's rights to freedom of expression have been threatened. And I asked my colleagues today, um, you know, how many live cases have we got? And they're currently, just this week, dealing with 150 open cases. So we're extremely busy, unfortunately. <laughs> um, we now have a, an eight-strong legal and caseworker team. Uh, 
offering advice and support and working with an extensive network of lawyers. So um, in uh, Toby's other relevant hat tonight, however, is that of editor-in-chief of The Daily Skeptic, the successor blog to Lockdown Skeptics. Um, and as a result of which, I think it's fair to say he's been on the front line of many of the most acrimonious recent battles over science, evidence and policy making, drawing fire over lockdown, vaccines, climate change and no doubt other issues still to come. Um, I'm sure that in the room tonight we'll have some Toby fans and some Toby foes. Um, and the fact that people often jump across from one camp to another, depending on the latest thing he's written or said, is not entirely explicable, uh, but it's perhaps testament to his prodigious output and his tendency to run towards rather than hide from controversy. Um, I hope I'm not setting him up here <laughs> too much for, for the evening ahead. Uh, just to add, he's, he has some other hats. Um, he's also co-founded Four Schools and a multi-academy trust in West London. He's an associate editor of The Spectator, was formerly an associate editor of Quillette, and is the author or co-author of three peer-reviewed academic articles and four books, the best known of which is How to Lose Friends and Alienate People. Um, so can we welcome Toby? So Tracy and Toby are going to kick off by giving us about 10 minutes uh, introduction uh, with their thoughts, uh, reflecting on the, the previous two lectures, uh, and also trying to identify the most important contemporary forces that they think are undermining public confidence in science. So Tracy's going to go first, and she's going to come to the lectern. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan. Thank you very much. And, and then thank you particularly at this point, at the end of the series, for organising everything so well. Um, I'm really delighted that what this has done, never mind the enjoyment of the sessions and the discussions that we've had, um, is it's captured um, both Alan and Paul um, uh, for posterity uh, with the wonderful uh, insights that they shared with us. Um, so I'm going to say something with some reflection uh, on, on what they've said and, and think about how we set an agenda for our discussion tonight. Alan gave us a wonderful lecture on the critical spirit behind scientific inquiry, particularly its aspiration to objectivity, which as a mathematician he shares with science, but uh, as a mathematician uh, he doesn't share the way we go about proving things, that mathematics uses logical proof to determine whether or not something is true and we know it to be true or false. But Alan looked instead at the much messier world of scientific research where we can say that some things are true based on probabilities. We have a sense of, of, of how likely they are to be true. He looked at contested claims and a relatively recent phenomenon of contested claims in areas where quite established science uh, exists, where we're confident to talk in terms of facts, I would say, because we have knowledge that has been well tested and on which we've been able to build many other uh, assumptions and find them uh, uh, to hold true such as, for example, the presence of molecules for them uh, to, be, you know, to be required for them to be having an effect in the case of homeopathy uh, that he drew on. Or the firm reality of, of birth sex differences, regardless of the wider discussion we want to have as a society about how to include and recognise different identities. <clears throat> a point we might have perhaps more strongly drawn out in that discussion that Alan led was um, something that was very much on my mind uh, as he gave that lecture, which is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I think that's something um, that we should always remind ourselves of. It's a, it's a bit of a uh, pat phrase these days. But when you're looking at the kind of examples uh, that Alan was talking about, I think we need to, to reflect on that. And that was something I took away in big letters in my notebook. Paul Garner looked at contested claims too. Contested claims where the truth is not so apparent, where there are gaps in our knowledge, in medicine, in medicine in particular, or problems with the traditions of how research is organised. And this actually is a big barrier to knowledge. For example, the way that we distinguish between mind and body in the fields of medicine, uh, which means that we don't always ask the most relevant questions uh, that we need to treat patients. I'm sure many of you know psychologists or sociologists or historians who come at the same issue asking only the questions that uh, uh, arise in their discipline. When you've got a hammer, everything around you looks like a nail, and I think that's a fair criticism to levy uh, at many areas of science, and particularly 
uh, medicine. So to Paul talked about uh, what we do when the, when the truth isn't obvious um, and how we create a more critical um, uh, viewpoint on things that we've taken to become true. So, for example, he didn't talk about tonsillectomies, but I thought he could have uh, very easily, where surgeons are absolutely convinced that their patients have recovered much better as a result of their surgical intervention uh, and are quite shocked to discover that when you do a trial uh, and you randomise your patients, you discover that there's no uh, appreciable difference as a result of tonsillectomy. Uh, and there are things that Paul talked about where we have contested claims and there's a way to resolve them is to bring together that evidence and try to step up to an even more objective way of asking those questions. And that was what gave birth to the Cochrane collaboration in medicine and since then the Campbell collaboration in, in um, social science, which is reviewing the research and data using this more objective method of research synthesis. And Paul looked at the resistance to change that has occurred in some scientific institutions. But he also reminded us that the greatest challenges to have come to, for medicine come from within the specialist domains. It is from people who know how to set the really tricky questions uh, that get us closer to an unbiased, objective appraisal of the information that we have. And indeed, there is a great tradition of grand rounds in medicine. That's the thing that happens uh, on Fridays in a hospital uh, where everyone gets together and talks about a mistake. Uh, as a, a tradition of, of speaking frankly about things that, that might have gone wrong. Well, I think it would now be good to consider contested truths in another way. And that is where people don't like the consequences or the implications of scientific findings. And so they contest the science on which those implications are based. The science says, I think, maybe uh, 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 is a, another description of the same thing, where we have a debate about science, but really we're having a debate about politics. So what I'm talking about is, is using science to avoid a political discussion or transferring political and social debates into the realm of science. So let's look at it from the side of the authorities and where we often call it scientism. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that's particularly useful. I think thinking of it more as... Uh, using science to avoid politics is, is um, actually more, more insightful, um, gives us better insight into what's going on. Science is used to prop up authority or to abdicate responsibility. And in the UK, it was particularly fashionable in government in the noughties. So this is when I first really encountered it, um, was uh, against a backdrop of the introduction of departmental chief scientists across the UK government, um, and the evidence in policy movement, of which Sense About Science was a firm part. That opportunity of people talking about the importance of listening to sound science, of looking at the evidence, was not missed by politicians who saw in it the opportunity to get scientists to win certain battles. And so we had it, two that stand out to me particularly were GMOs, which had been a long and intract intractable debate, and the disposable of, disposal of legacy waste from British nuclear fuels. Now, the hope was that these difficult and seemingly intractable arguments could now be won by science, where politics had failed, or where politics meant, uh, probably more truthfully, falling out with people that the government would prefer not to fall out with. The government didn't want a row with Greenpeace. It would rather that the scientists had the row with Greenpeace, thank you, uh, and resolved it in a committee. Right. Science appeared to be, at that point, I think, an authority trump card. But... <clears throat> It led to a new phenomenon pretty rapidly, which is that of rejecting the science as a form of protest against the policy. And so we ended up with a situation that I would describe uh, of, uh, as countering dogma with dogma. And here we see, uh, here we find ourselves after the, the uh, COVID uh, experience, um, with uh, concerns about the use and misuse of science by policymakers when really what they should be talking about is the basis on which they've made a value judgment. Um, but what they get in response is snatched factoids thrown at them um, of, of alternative science. For me, science, when you confront scientism or the politicization of science, the answer is not to throw away sound cri critical questioning or come up with back of an envelope calculations uh, uh, and so on. I think for me, the answer is to ask better questions. 
because otherwise we just have a row of the dogmas, and I think that's where we ended up uh, on a number of issues in relation to the pandemic. I was very struck, years ago I read a book by James Robert Brown um, about Alan Sokal's hoax, which we heard about in previous um, lectures. And what struck me was he really got to the heart of it, which is the point that the authorities have the guns and the money. Knowledge is the power that's left to the rest of us. And that's really what Alan's, Alan's hoax was about, was about preserving that knowledge, not throwing that baby out with the bathwater in any debate. And it's something we feel really keenly at Sense About Science, because we mobilise people to insist that public life is equipped with the best available evidence and its use or rejection is openly discussed. And we've done so really successfully. Jan mentioned some of the things that we've done. We wrote and, and, and fought for the public interest defence to libel uh, and successfully uh, led to the Defamation Act of 2013. All Trials was a global campaign where with tens of thousands of members of the public and doctors and researchers and many others, we, we got changes to the law uh, forcing companies and academics uh, to publish all of their clinical trials, not just the half that they'd like you to read. Um, independent science advice was a response to the David Nutt sacking. I promised myself I would never say that again. Um, the sacking of David Nutt, um, following his remarks uh, 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 as an independent science advisor about, uh, uh, about ecstasy. Uh, and now that's in the ministerial code, which is the protection of people giving independent science advice to government can't be summarily dismissed. Um, transparency rules, as Jan mentioned, is something that's very much on our minds at Sense About Science as we go into the election, and many uh, reports that this government has commissioned remain um, uh, delayed or suppressed, as some of us say. Um, and uh, Fiona Fox isn't in the room tonight but, um, uh, from the Science Media Centre, but I would also talk about an achievement in the overinterpretation of PERDA to shut down academics who are funded by government agencies uh, during a pre-election period, which is something that we've successfully dealt with uh, with her leadership. <clears throat> when evidence is misused, hidden or abused, we do mobilise tens of thousands of people and we put it right. And we're active and we're purposeful. So it's very disappointing for me if the challenge to the poor use of, or communication of science is reduced to rhetorical dogma. It drives those discussions and that energy and that questioning passion into the sand. And it works, it gives both science and it gives us both science, bad science and bad politics because it's so easily dismissed. It closes off very important discussions, the kinds of things that Paul Garner raised where there are genuine disagreements in science and they really are in many areas of science. In climate, for example, Important discussions about what the average warming hides. You know, we get an average figure. Average warming hides a heck of a lot of regional variation uh, uh, and difference in there. And scientists disagree strongly about what those uh, uh, are going to be. And, but I can see why scientists don't want to run that gauntlet. To be accused of alarmism for saying goodbye to Norfolk and complacency for saying everything will be fine in Surrey. And I think what happens when we have a dogmatic response is that you cause scientists to close down, pull out, close ranks, pull back from public discussion, and we all end up the poorer for it. So briefly, I promise, Jan, um, how do we call it out? What does good look like in the world of science and policy? Because we've got to do both. I think, crucially, number one is the separation of testable and pollable questions. Um, and if I say, for example, that Bradford should host the Olympics because that's a really prestigious thing to do for the city, that's a value statement. You can agree with me, you can disagree with me. Uh, if I say Brad Bradford should host the Olympics because more kids will take up sport and it will reduce childhood obesity in the region, that's a testable question. If I say um, that we should give tax breaks to married people because I like married people and I think they're a bastion of our community, that's a value judgment and you can choose whether you agree with me or disagree with me. If I say giving tax breaks to married people uh, will reduce uh, antisocial behaviour by improving family values, that's a testable question and you can test it. Okay? So I think we need to be much clearer about when we're talking about a pollable question, one on which we can have an opinion, and a, set, and a testable question, one on which we can set up a test and find out uh, what the answer looks like. <clears throat> I think we need to insist too on openness about the trade-offs and having the opportunity to discuss them. And that's political. Dan mentioned that lockdown sceptics and so on. I think actually what a lot of people wanted to do there was to talk about what they found acceptable 
um, and instead ended up in a, in a discussion, a sort of COD discussion about science, um, it would have been much better for us to have a discussion about things like what we thought about closing schools uh, for other reasons, not just simply the transmission statistics or the transmission dynamics. Um, we should have had discussions about um, things that people thought were not reasonable trade-offs to be made in society. But because there wasn't that discussion, instead we had it appear as a, as a sort of quasi-scientific discussion and it very much wasn't that. <clears throat> and then for ourselves, so we should insist on those things in public life and in a really meaningful way. Um, rather than try to have them in this kind of sort of throwing facts around like rhetorical dogma. I think also for ourselves in understanding the science, we need to equip ourselves with good questions and be serious in our contemplation of the answers to those questions. That means being prepared to accept that the answers may not imply what we would wish to be the case. Do masks work? You know, I think we have to ask that question only if we're prepared to accept the answer, or at least to separate out the scientific evidence uh, uh, that might go one way or another uh, from the question of whether we would still object to something. And if so, ask ourselves, why would we? Because we perhaps hold some value to be more important to us than the evidence. Um, and let's be frank about it and have honest discussions with ourselves about which things are values and which things are facts or attempts at facts. Because the power of science is the ability to transcend how things appear and to ask how they really are. Thank you. Um, I asked um, Thomas Harris um, uh, 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 the, the, our, our kind of um, uh, data specialist within the Free Speech Union beforehand, um, what percentage of the cases that we've taken on over the past, um, I think this is over the past year, these cases, you give me the data on, or is this, is this, is this the last four plus years? whole period so over the over the over the, over the four plus years so we set up the free speech union in february 2020 and since then um interestingly 47 percent of the cases we've taken on and we've taken on 2500 plus cases have had a kind of scientific component and um about seven percent of them um are well six percent were related to covid um in particular people saying heretical unorthodox things about masks and vaccines and the lockdown, um, but only 6%, rather surprisingly. 1%, um, only 1% um, of our cases um, have been people who've said heretical, unorthodox things about the climate, the environment, uh, so-called climate change denialists. And then 40% um, are, for the most part, gender-critical feminists who've run into difficulty um, uh, for expressing their gender-critical beliefs often at universities, often in the NHS, but in other parts of the public sector too, and in some cases part of the private sector. And I wanted just, 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 just um, to distinguish between um, the 7% um, and the 40%, because often the kind of underlying um, heresy that they're being accused of is, is different in an interesting way, which I think relates to what Alan Sokol and Paul Garner talked about. So um, if we take the smaller percentage first, um, the 6% who have got into trouble for challenging COVID vaccine orthodoxy and the 1% who've got into trouble for challenging climate orthodoxy, I'd say that the reason they've got into trouble is because the guardians of scientific knowledge regard scientific knowledge as being on the side of their particular political project, their agenda, their public policies. Um, and if people, whether, whether that be um, net zero or the lockdown policy or trying to persuade everyone to get vaccinated during the pandemic, they think that, that science supports their position. Um, as you said, Tracy, they invoke the science, often as a way of avoiding having um, a more taxing 
political discussion. Um, uh, but they, they, when, when, they, when they invoke the science, they're sort of pretending um, to a kind of naive um, epistemological realism, which often they don't really believe in. You see this, I think, most plainly, where people appeal to fact checkers. People say, no, if you think masking isn't effective, I don't care if you've conducted a, 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 a systematic review of the scientific literature. I don't even care if you're doing it under the banner of the Cochrane Review and you're a distinguished biomedical scientist. What you've said is misinformation. And it's misinformation because it challenges the scientific orthodoxy. There's this pretense that these are open and shut issues. There isn't any complexity or nuance to this debate. The science, and you get this in the climate argument too, the science is settled. There's nothing complicated about it. It's open and shut, it's binary. If you're challenging it, if you're challenging the scientific basis for these public policies that we're advocating, we believe in, and we believe are supported by the science, then you are trafficking in misinformation or disinformation, or you're a denialist in the pay of the fossil fuel industry or whatever it might be. So there's this, there's this kind of, the argument is always that um, science is a fairly simple, straightforward process. It's just a matter of identifying reality. Um, and we, uh, uh, anyone who challenges it is, is some kind of reality denier. They're, in the, they're not in the reality-based community. Uh, and then you get, I think, with the 40%, with the, the cases um, involving gender-critical feminists, um, the objection is um, not quite diametrically opposite, but very different. Um, so, you know, it's not when someone states something which, until very recently, was an incontestable biological fact, um, it's kind of quite hard to argue that they're trafficking in misinformation or disinformation, or that does, does happen. Um, it, it, it seems to be um, uh, 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 the argument is more that um, certain scientific facts um, uh, should be neglected, ignored, suppressed, because they challenge are sacred left-wing values, often radical progressive left-wing values. It's, not the, it's, it's a completely different argument to saying, you are the denialists, science is on our side. COVID, climate, science is on our side. We can invoke the science uh, uh, to, to support these policy positions. With the objections to uh, the gender-critical feminists, the argument is, well, what you're saying almost, what you're saying might be true. It might be an incontestable biological fact, but you can't say it because it challenges our sacred religious beliefs, almost. Um, and um, uh, to give you an example, um, uh, we're involved in a case at the moment um, uh, in which um, the, the Free Speech Union is helping a couple of, um, uh, uh, well, one is a mathematician and one is a social scientist, Michael Biggs and John Armstrong. Um, uh, challenge a decision by the British Medical Journal not to publish um, a couple of papers that they had submitted. In Michael Biggs's case, it was a paper about the unreliability of the census data, uh, and in particular, the data that identified the percentage of the population, I think in England and Wales, that were trans. Michael Biggs asserted that um, if you look at the data, um, uh, it becomes clear that many people who seemed to confirm that they were trans didn't understand the question because English wasn't their first language. And that's why, for instance, um, the highest concentration of trans people in England and Wales, according to the national census, is in Newham, um, a, 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 a borough of East London, um, uh, which happens to have the highest concentration of non-English speaking people as well, or people for whom English isn't their first language. So anyway, he, he, he produced this paper and the BMJ rejected it, and um, uh, John Armstrong's paper was about, um, uh, it, it was even more heretical. Um, he, 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 he'd uh, done some research which found that um, institutions with higher Athena Swan ratings, uh, which is an award given for promoting gender equality, as I'm sure you know, those institutions with the highest Athena Swan uh, ratings had the fewest women in senior roles, curiously. Um, uh, uh, so um, uh, a horribly heretical thing to say. Um, uh, and um, that was rejected too, and um, uh, we advised them to submit um, uh, 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 SARs uh, to find out if they could, why these papers had been rejected. And um, in Michael Biggs's case, it was because 
He was accused, uh, his piece, according to an internal staff email, portrayed trans individuals as uneducated and implies they weren't able to understand the question on the census. Well, that, that's a fundamental misunderstanding of Michael Biggs's point. He wasn't saying that trans individuals couldn't understand the question and therefore answered it wrong. He was saying that non-trans cisgendered people misunderstood it and, and, and identified as trans. Anyway, um, uh, and um, in John Armstrong's case, um, it was partly because, um, and this was again uh, from a staffer's email, um, he'd um, retweeted a JK Rowling post supporting Maya Forstatter. Um, but the BMJ, having rejected these papers, for what on the face of it seemed like straightforward ideological reasons. You're trampling on these sacred values, which we cannot afford to in any way challenge. Um, uh, and even though your papers might be true and might pass the peer review process, we're just not going to publish them because they are um, uh, heretical. They offend against our secular religious sensibilities. Instead of saying that, they said um, uh, they denied that they'd rejected the paper for political or ideological reasons. So trying to kind of remain somehow in the reality-based community and pretend, uh, often you find this, that the, the, this pretense that uh, somehow they don't meet rigorous scientific standards, their research isn't up to snuff, or maybe they didn't um, uh, satisfy the ethics root board or whatever it might be. Uh, spurious reasons, really what's going on is that the people, the gatekeepers have in themselves become uh, science denialists, left-wing science denialists. They don't want to publish science which challenges their point of view. Very different to the reason for rejecting so-called COVID and climate misinformation. There, the argument is that um, science is on our side and what you're saying is just straightforwardly wrong and unscientific. Here they're saying, well, actually, science isn't, our, isn't on our side. It actually challenges our precious left-wing values, so we're not going to publish it very different positions. But this was, I think, really clearly brought out in something Alan touched upon um, uh, in uh, his lecture, which is um, a, uh, and again, the, the, th this was a case that the Free Speech Union of New Zealand was involved in, and we were only involved in it uh, tangentially. Um, but um, it was a case of two scientists uh, in, in um, New Zealand. Um, uh, so, so a group of scientists in New Zealand, when um, the government decided a few years ago that um, the Maori um, understanding of the world should be taught alongside the scientific understanding of the world and that the scientific understanding shouldn't be privileged in any way over the Maori cosmology. Um, and um, seven fairly distinguished scientists wrote a uh, joint letter to a publication called The Listener um, objecting to this. They said, well, we can see the value of children being taught uh, Maori theology, cosmology. Of course, they should, everyone should understand that aspect of New Zealand's culture, but it shouldn't be taught as if um, it's as valid a way of understanding the world um, um, as, as science. Um, and um, interestingly, um, uh, uh, two of these, uh, two, they were all professors at the University of Auckland, and as soon as the letter was published, um, a We the Undersigned petition started circulating, mainly signed by scientists, also at the University of Auckland, uh, demanding um, uh, that they be punished. Um, and it was signed by over 2,000 predominantly uh, scientists. Um, and they also wrote to the Royal Society two of these um, uh, signatories of the, the letter and the listener, Garth Cooper and Robert Nola, were members of the Royal Society, and they demanded that the Royal Society open an investigation into these heretics, and the, the Royal Society duly obliged. Um, and in the end, they were exonerated, thanks, I think, in part to the efforts of the New Zealand Free Speech Union. But it was interesting. It was almost like a kind of version of the Scopes trial. Um, and again, this is where I think it was really clear. Um, uh, it was as though we, the guardians of, of, of scientific orthodoxy, no longer really believe in science. We think scientific knowledge is socially constructed and therefore oughtn't to be privileged over the Maori understanding of the world. Um, uh, uh, so it was, it, but, but, but the difference between um, the Scopes trial and this kind of quasi-judicial process unfolding in the New Zealand Royal Society was that all the, the, the scientists were all on the side of the people who were sort of taking the creationist position in the Scopes trial. So it was like a kind of weird rerun of the Scopes trial, but in which all the most educated, liberal, scientifically literate people were opposed to 
the kind of uh, the scientists who'd written this letter and were arguing actually in favour of a religious theological point of view in opposition to a conventional scientific understanding of the universe. And um, just to conclude, um, uh, one of the things I think that um, both of these, I mean, let's call, the, let's call the first point of view naive realism and the second point of view sophisticated relativism. But one of the things they have in common is that they're both left-wing points of view. The first is associated with the kind of uh, old-fashioned, traditional liberal intelligentsia, I'd say, and the second with the more radical postmodern intelligentsia. But they're both leftist points of view. Um, and, um, and I think, I think um, one thing we should worry about is that um, uh, public trust in science seems to be polarising along political lines. Um, and uh, there, was a, there was a Pew survey um, uh, done um, in 2022, which found essentially that there was much more trust in science amongst left-leaning Americans than there was amongst right-leaning Americans. So in 2020, 62% of left-leaning Americans said they had a great deal of trust in scientists to do what's right for the public, versus just 20% of Americans leaning to the right. And in 2022, that had declined in both categories. So among Democrats and Democrat-leaning independents, uh, those expressing strong confidence uh, in science had fallen by 10% to around 50%, and among Republicans and people leaning Republican, it had fallen to just 15%. Um, and um, I think there is a risk that if we allow left-leaning scientists, whether radical progressives or more traditional Labour Party scientists, um, to suppress dissent, to cancel people, either because they think they're science denialists or denying their particular kind of theological dogma. Um, uh, the people that are going to be penalised are, for the most part, people on the right or right-leaning, or people on the left but who don't um, uh, belong to the radical progressive left, in which I'd count most of the gender-critical feminists that we've defended. Um, at least don't, be don't belong to the radical progressive left anymore. Um, and I think the real danger is that if, if we allow public trust in science to become polarised like this, if we don't do more to stop people who challenge the conventional left and the radical progressive left in their scientific citadels, if we don't do more to protect them and protect free speech, um, then um, it's going to be bad news for science. When people like Trump win elections, when populist parties triumph in various European countries and in the European elections, uh, that could pose, I think, a real challenge to uh, various scientific institutions, the willingness of people to fund scientific research and so on and so forth. So science, I think, has got itself into this pickle. And the way to get it out of the pickle is to much more robustly stand up to these um, uh, uh, inqu inquisitors, uh, whether conventional left-wing inquisitors or radical progressive inquisitors. Thanks, Sadie. <laughs> Any initial responses to that, uh, Tracy? The, the uh, diagnosis of the pickle? I think it is a pickle, um, but I, I think it's an interesting one to put in the mix because it's, it's quite a far advance in the US, this yeah. situation that you're describing, Toby, and, and I think it's made it very difficult to have a reasoned discussion in a whole number of domains. Um, and I, I think it's not the same thing as confidence in science and trust in science. I think it's, it's actually where science is seen as doing the job of politics. So I think in that sense, would you not say that's really what's going on here? To kind of, I mean, I'm not sorry to bang on this drum again, but you know, that's what's happening in these cases, is people are not giving the time to try to win the arguments on, on their own terms. Um, the reason I'm speaking slowly yeah. is I'm thinking too, and I'm wondering what's happened to people's commitment to the values that you're talking about, that they don't try yeah. and win the argument in terms of the values that they espouse and instead want to borrow from science to do this. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I think I agree that one of the reasons um, people um, are so quick to appeal to the science 
um, is in the hope of sidestepping um, having an argument because what, what's really at stake is a conflict of values and they're, less, they're not very comfortable navigating that. So they'll sidestep it and pretend it's a simple question with a simple answer. And I think one of the reasons um, for the rise of um, fact checkers um, and um, the desire on the part of the you know, um, censorship industrial complex and its various agencies across multiple regions to um, suppress misinformation and disinformation is, again, it's a kind of response to po the populist challenge. It's, it's, it's the pretense that there isn't actually an argument here. It's not a conflict of values. It's not that they've been failing to make their case in the public square that they're losing all these arguments and losing these elections. Um, rather, it's because the public is being misinformed by bad actors, often with malign motives. And so the solution is not to engage in that argument that they've been avoiding, um, but to suppress those who challenge their various policy positions. Uh, but, but it, but it's on the right too. I mean, you've, you've located this firmly in the left, right? And yet I have seen so often the, the abortion debate recast as things like fetal viability and trying to prove that fetuses are viable at 23 weeks for example, which is where a lot of anti-abortionists started to park their arguments and they made it an argument about the science and the evidence. Um, so it's not just a left-wing thing doing that, is it? Borrowing from science instead of making your case on religious or moral or value-based grounds. No, it isn't. It isn't um, exclusively a sin of the left, but um, it seems to be predominantly a sin of the left. One, one thing I... I slightly disagree with you about is it's true that um, science is often invoked as a way of sidestepping having a proper political argument but often once it's once the debate has been relocated um, there's then an avoidance of having a scientific argument either um, uh, and there's increasingly less tolerance for open discussion and debate in the scientific community. I mean, one reason I think that Paul Garner has um, experienced um, uh, uh, quite a lot of hostility um, is because um, uh, making, making the argument or exploring the hypothesis that, that um, uh, you know, various post-COVID conditions aren't, for the most part, biomedical, but psychosocial, challenges part of challenges the kind of covid lockdown consensus which is invested in exaggerating the risk posed to the general public by covid and if you if 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 you if you're claiming that actually these post covid complications aren't biomedical then that undermines the argument that um, the lockdown was justified, the various vaccination programs, the vaccine passports to induce people to get vaccinated, they were all justified because not only was COVID a killer, but it had these terrible uh, post-COVID complications too. So that's the reason I think there's an unwillingness to debate that issue within the kind of scientific community. And it's quite difficult for people like Paul and his colleagues to get published in journals like Nature because um, you know scientists are as unwilling to debate these kind of politically coded arguments with kind of values-based and ideological kind of bases any more so than people are, politicians are in the public square. But I, I would say that you, you, sometimes the things that you do with the skeptic, promote that because if you publish cranks or things which, I mean, I'm sure you, you know, some things turn out to be cranks, perhaps you aren't aware of it at the time, but if you publish cranks, what will happen is people will, it comes back to what I'm saying, they, they pick between two dogmas and they'll pick the one that they think can add up better or they'll pick the one that actually at least has some cogent scientific foundation around it. Um, it kind of causes that closing of ranks, whereas I think if... You know, I don't think that's the way to attack it, by finding some kind of real fringe opinion um, and trying to sort of lob that into the debate. I think there are better ways to do this by actually looking at um, the discussion that's going on in the science. So that's where the interesting stuff really lies. And I feel we don't get it sometimes. It shuts that down. Isn't, isn't it, rather than dogma, wouldn't, isn't it um, another way of understanding it about, as being when science comes up against identity? So it's not that people start off dogmatic necessarily, but when their identity, whether that's their sickness identity um, or their gender identity, they see that as being threatened, 
then the um, response is incredibly ferocious. And I think that also crossed over in, uh, emerged in lockdown as well, where you know, we did have warring camps between mask wearers and non-mask wearers and, um, and, and vaxxers and non-vaxxers. And that kind of, quite often now, you know, even now you see people feel like they have to declare, I had the vaccine or I didn't have the vaccine. And so that kind of um, move into identity, I'm not even sure I'd call it dogma as such, because it seems so deeply personal and I think that might well explain the animosity and the sort of ferocious, the ferocity of the, of, the, of the pushback that people like Paul experience and other people as well, and, and Toby as well in some ways. I, I see it as um, more political than that. So um, uh, I think that um, there was, to my mind, um, an exaggeration of the risk posed by COVID-19 um, to all sectors of the population um, in order to justify a kind of power grab by the establishment, by the elite, um, by politicians um, for a variety of reasons. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I think they just couldn't resist the opportunity to be the saviors of the population. But in order to cast themselves in that role, they needed to exaggerate the risk posed by COVID-19. But one way to enhance their argument and their authority was to introduce this identitarian dimension to the risk and claim that vulnerable communities were at a greater risk uh, from COVID-19 than ordinary members of the population. So not just the elderly, but there was an argument that Muslims, people of West Indian heritage, uh, were much more vulnerable, people with underlying medical conditions. I mean, it, of course, in some cases it's true, but um, this kind of combination of um, uh, uh, safetyism and um, protecting the most vulnerable. Um, and that, 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 was, that sort of part, it was all, part, it was all but, part of a kind of justification for a kind of massive power grab. But protecting the most vulnerable would be a very reasonable thing for society to do, wouldn't it? Well, it would be, but um, I think they exaggerated the risk to the vulnerable in order to justify the... Um, you know, locking everyone in their homes. I mean, I think that's why it's often curious. You see um, pro-Palestinian protesters and other um, uh, anti-government protesters wearing masks. It's become part of the uniform in the same way that badges used to be in the 70s. Why is that? It's partly to hide their faces from facial recognition technology, but it's also partly to advertise that they care about protecting the most vulnerable because they believe that one of the things about COVID and the reason they support lockdowns and support masking and vaccination and the rest of it is because it was the most vulnerable people, these marginalized groups, particularly people of color who were most at risk. And that gives them they, that sort of moral authority to demand the state do more to protect us all. But it also shift, mask wearing shifted a norm, which was the traditionally that you do not cover, we do not cover our faces. And this is where it comes into the values and norms question beyond the science, um, which was you know, a reasonable response uh, to masking was to say, well, we've never done this before in public spaces. What are the cons Let's weigh up what the consequences might be, certainly outside the clinical setting, of making everybody wear masks, children wear masks in schools, etc. And that's where the additional... The, the sort of non-science or social science or the humanities and just humanity <laughs> itself really didn't come in. I, I, so the, the intention of this is not to have a debate about lockdown itself, so maybe we shouldn't uh, get too much down that, that particular alley. But um, I just wonder how... Uh, where's, uh, one of the questions that came up f from the two lectures, really, is where, where should science sit relative to all the other aspects of human knowledge, I suppose. Should, does science need to be put back in its place or has it actually been <laughs> sidelined in a way that Toby suggests with the kind of relativization of knowledge? How do we, where should it sit? Mm. One of the things I think we have to be really careful of is once you have a popularization of, of a science-based discussion or a science-linked discussion, you, we have to be careful that every articulation of that doesn't get wrapped up and called what the science says, you know, because... You know, if you've got a bunch of middle-class professionals who really like the fact that the filthy, oikish working class are covering their faces and not breathing on me anymore, you know, other people's, people's prejudices about the world are going to come into play, or people who wear it to, to determine that, that, you know, to, to, in the same way that they'll virtue signal any other subject. You know, there's all sorts of things happening, and people are saying all kinds of things, and we shouldn't 
I think, look at that and imagine that that's all what the science is saying or the science argument. Otherwise, we can just end up disliking you know, different groups of people in society and therefore casting uh, uh, our net around the, the science. I, I just think it's not helpful for us. What we need to do is assume that public life will be crap sometimes, that politicians will behave badly. So how do we set out what we think you know, science should be doing in public discussion? You know, what role do scientists play? For example, Jan, one of the real concerns I have is should we be telling scientists to shut up when it comes to things like decisions of, of this nature, how to respond to a pandemic? Is there a line where we say, no, this is now politics, this is now policy, these are now value statements? Um, do we want to discourage people from speaking outside their lane more than we currently do? There are some questions this has really raised for me, but I don't think we can just say, because some people had objectionable opinions or they, they presented themselves as pro-science and they didn't know what they were talking about, I don't think we can, we can just dismiss the argument, whether it's around masks or anything else. OK, uh, so let's, um, let's go out to the floor. We've got over half an hour for uh, Q&A. So, uh, yes, right at the back there, Vinay. Great, yeah. Good evening. Uh, my, my name's Simon Singh. I was a trustee of Centre of Science many, many years ago. Um, I wanted to come back to a point that Tracy was making. I don't know whether she fully got an answer or whether she fully explored what she wanted to say. But you said that people who don't like the conclusions sometimes contest the science. I was wondering to what extent, Tracy, you felt that Toby was guilty of that. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> um, and I think, I think that following Toby's... Um, and I didn't follow you very closely during um, uh, for COVID, Toby, because some of the stuff you shared tried my patience. But, um, but I, um, I think that there were times, particularly around the discussion around lockdown, when I think... You, there should have been a much better discussion about um, the, the purpose of lockdown, not in a scientific sense, but uh, whether or not we felt that it was okay to do and what the consequences of that might be. I think there were discussions about the trade-offs of closing schools, for example, whether we wanted to say, do you know what, to hell with the transmission dynamics, um, education is more important. Um, those were discussions that would have been really useful for us to have and then to decide whether or not the evidence made us so fearful of the consequence that we would not do it. But I, don't, I just feel that you didn't contribute to the political discussions that we, and the trade-off discussions that we so badly needed to have. And instead, you ended up in some real fringe debates, sort of sharing stuff that was, that was just not helping us to understand any of these scientific questions. I would say so. Um, I mean, actually, can I ask you, do you yeah. now feel, looking back... Do you now feel that you should have separated the discussions a bit more clearly between those things which were actually a discussion about science and maybe advocated more strongly to have the policy and values discussions that we needed to have? Well, I think we, we did try and have some of those. You know, we, I published people in the lockdown sceptics, as it then was, um, making you know, a political argument for not locking down, you know, not just challenging the scientific rationale. Um, I think it was, I mean, I think um, I may have been guilty of sometimes um, uh, exaggerating how clear the science was about just how ineffective lockdown was as a way of um, reducing disease and death from COVID. Um, uh, but I think I made far fewer mistakes of that nature than people on the other side. Um, uh, and I think you, you, you said that sometimes we discussed people, uh, sorry, published people who were a bit fringe and it wasn't helpful to publish them. But, you know, it's not always clear, particularly when you're in the midst of a pandemic and our understanding of a virus is evolving quickly. It's not always clear what is a fringe opinion that should be dismissed, and what is a fringe opinion that may turn out to be true. So, I mean, the obvious example is in 2020, towards the end of 2020, um, a lot of people um, uh, started putting forward the hypothesis that the, the, virus, the virus had originated in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the lab leak hypothesis, which was dismissed um, sometimes by people who actually believed it themselves as a conspiracy theory. And interestingly, um, 
Penny Mordaunt and her opposite number, um, Lucy Powell, commissioned a guide to conspiracy theories, which has now been distributed to every MP, every candidate, and every member of the House of Lords. And it's been put together by six different groups who we should supposedly trust about what is and isn't a conspiracy theory. And two of those groups, Full Fact and the um, uh, Centre for Strategic Dialogue, or something along those lines, um, uh, Institute of Strategic Dialogue, or the Strategic Dialogue, two of them identified the lab leak hypothesis in 2020 as a conspiracy theory. I mean, I think, um, I, mean, I guess my, my general view, Simon, is that, um, uh, like Margaret Thatcher, is that reality has a conservative bias. Um, and so my, I, I, I'm not a science denialist, um, and uh, m what, I, what, what, what I try and do in The Daily Skeptic, um, uh, and the reason I try and publish, for the most part, scientists um, challenging climate change orthodoxy, before that, lockdown orthodoxy, um, uh, is because I think that science itself can be appealed to to discredit these policies, that those policies are informed by the political biases of the scientists advocating them. Um, and that actually, if you, if you analyze you know, climate change, the lockdown policy in a uh, empirical way, which is faithful to the scientific method, the conclusion is much more likely to be a conservative one rather than a left-wing one. Now, you could say I'm biased, but in the other direction, and that it's unhelpful to try and invoke science on either side of these debates. We should try and keep politics out of science. But I think uh, my, my experience is, has taught me that reality itself has this right-wing bias, which is why I liked the editorial in Nature that Alan singled out as being particularly dangerous, saying even if something seems to meet scientific standards, it might pass peer review, uh, it might appeal to robust evidence, it might be based on systematic, systematic reviews of the scientific literature, we still won't publish it if it's gonna challenge our left-wing sacred values. Basically an admission that reality is not on their side, reality is on my side. So I liked that editorial from that point of view. I think one of the other things is, um, is that it's really easy to forget now just ha the extent to which everything other than science was totally delegitimized during the COVID crisis. And it was a total crisis. It wasn't just a crisis of, of public health. It was a crisis of everything. And that's the way normal people experienced it. So it's possible that maybe people involved in science and medicine may have been having different conversations to, to the conversations that normal, that normal people, lay people were having. And because we were just trying to make sense of the world beyond our garden gates, where everything, all rules had changed suddenly open up and they're, the, the, these extraordinary rules were introduced. And so the extent to which biz, you know, the economy, um, any kind of economic questions was just off the table. And if you dared to pose them, you were said to be somebody who wanted to benefit in some way from just keeping the economy going, letting people die. Um, or if you wanted, if you raised issues with children not going to school, it was, well, what do you want? Teachers to die? Granny's to die. I mean, it was so. It's really hard to remember, actually, just how crazy it was. I think, for, and disorienting for people, and how the only authority was was science, um, in a way that was really very unhelpful to science. I think. Can I just point out that it's also a frustration to many scientists mm. who were involved in this. So, so the modelers who were in Spy M, for example, could quite readily have modelled. Uh, and would, 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 were desperate, really, to be asked to model, um, how do we close the schools with the maximum benefit to reducing transmission and the minimum harm to children? How do you optimise these two outcomes? Because you can model that stuff, and it's one of the best ways of figuring out you know, where you get your low-hanging fruit and when you start to cause more damage, for example. There were lots and lots of scientists who felt that there were single-minded approaches to things that reduced everything to transmission dynamics um, and didn't think about broader um, uh, questions. So it wasn't only people outside the science who felt that way. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, my own experience of, of interacting with scientists, some of whom were on the government advisory boards, was that they were just as diverse, actually, in, in their desire to ask wider questions and so on. Yeah. I mean, it I think, was silenced. Yeah. People challenging the orthodoxy were silenced often by scientific gatekeepers. Yeah. 
Yeah, hang on. We're, we're gonna, you can put your hand up and uh, challenge in a sec. Um, OK. Uh, I guess you might as well go behind you there. So the chap in the white shirt. Yeah, um, firstly, I'm hugely impressed by um, Toby's achievement in establishing the Free Speech Union and the Daily Skeptic. And I'd, I'd really love to know how he did it. Um, I'm a published peer-reviewed author on complex scientific and technical and medical evidence uh, for what it's worth. Um, do you agree that until those in the sciences and the legacy media start being honest about how little we know and can know using sciences, that we cannot restore confidence in the sciences? And giving ex examples, modelling is one of the many examples which don't work, along with expert forecasting, which has been proven by Professor Philip Tetlock to be a complete and utter nonsense. OK, right. That, that, a short question would be ideal. Thank you. That's Perfect. Good. Thank you so much. Um, should we take another question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Michelle there is at the back. Thanks. Um, yes, my question is about the epistemologies that um, Toby was talking about. So I just sort of thought, given that most academics are actually quite left-wing, um, I was concerned that caricaturing the problem, what, what you might sort of think of as the more problematic epistemologies, um, that caricaturing those as being left-wing um, might actually be um, cause issues in, 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 in terms of closing people's ears to the possibility that there are some sort of more problematic epistemologies. Um, so I, I was hoping that Debbie could talk more to what the advantages were of labelling those as being left-wing. Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, I can see from a kind of, um, it, it may be a bit impolitic um, to label some of the more um, censorious scientists, um, scientific gatekeepers, as being left wing. Um, and you're more likely, I guess, to win over people who disagree scientists who themselves have been silenced but who identify as left if you um, take that kind of binary politics out of it. But I guess I nevertheless do feel that most denialism now in science um, is coming from the left, not the right. And it's, it's long been my ambition to write a book called left-wing science denialism, but I've, I've never been able to find the time. Um, but um, I agree with, with, with you about um, scientists. Um, it, it, I don't think scientists themselves um, uh, are all guilty of pretending to know much more than they do. I mean, in certain areas, clearly. Um, uh, but um, it suits politicians to pretend that they are simply being guided by these infallible experts. Um, and I think science has allowed itself to be co-opted by what appears to be a kind of um, uh, flailing cognitive elite whose authority is under attack. Um, I think it was undermined by the global credit crunch in 2007-08. It was undermined again um, by the mishandling of the pandemic. I think it was undermined by overselling the vaccines and understating the safety risks and so forth. And we're beginning to see, I think, the effects of that in what appear to be the um, coming populist revolts this year, particularly in Europe, but also in America. And I think in a way, scientists, of course, aren't infallible. Um, their expert advice doesn't um, axiomatically point to a left wing rather than a conservative policy, but they've allowed themselves to be co-opted by the kind of liberal, global, cognitive elite. And now that that elite are on the ropes and may yet kind of collapse completely, the risk is that they're going to take science down with them because scientists have allowed themselves to be used in this way. But it's also the science you notice, Toby, because it's the opinions that annoy you the most. Um, That's true. Um, OK, right. No, I'm not going to come back to you because you've already asked a question. Uh, so the lady just here. Hello. Um, Mr Young, I couldn't disagree with you more. Uh, sorry. I'm really sorry about this. You've missed out a huge elephant in the room, which is the critical 
race, critical identity, critical all sorts of things, theory that comes from the US that is fundamentally pulled down all established knowledge and especially scientific knowledge because it requires years of study and a mind that is interested in learning connections, thinking about connections and establishing a whole body of knowledge that spans from maths to the smallest detail of biology and um, evolution. And it's that that we have to contend with, that ignorance. And it's, the, it's at the gate. I'm sorry. Are, are, you, def are you saying that the, um, the, the gender professors and the critical race theorists have um, informed our understanding of scientific knowledge in an interesting way, and we have to respond to that challenge? Or are you saying they've corrupted it, and that's the root of the evil? I'm afraid they've corrupted it. Okay, that well, I think you, we agree then. Thank you. <laughs> so that. Um, do you want to take a couple from the, the chat? Um, there's a question about um, what Tracy was saying about <clears throat> people challenging the science. So the person's, but I'm intrigued by Tracy's concept that people challenging, that people challenge science when they actually contest the politics which is affected by these conclusions. So, for example, is the dismissal, I don't know who by they've said, but just the dismissal of the CAS review um, relevant to that because of allegedly ignoring scientific research and findings about puberty blockers? If so, what can be done about this? Um, do you want me to take another one? Yeah, or, do one more. And then there's a kind of another, the only real other, I'd say, kind of question that we've got here is another challenge to Toby or kind of a deeper ask him to expand what he's saying. So Toby talks about the power grab, who's grabbing the power, and what are its effects. OK, thank you. Um, yep, yeah, over here, Mike. There. Oh, hi. Uh, thanks. I'll try to be as brief as I can, Jan. Uh, Toby, <laughs> uh, you mentioned these two types of uh, situation where you have, uh, if you like, a religious establishment being... Uh, questioned by, by uh, an external scientific-based questioning and then a, a scientific-based establishment uh, that, that, or one that claims to be scientific, uh, rebutting arguments that it claims are irrational. Um, it, it occurs to me that when you look at the history, the, 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 that those situations have, have, have repeated themselves over and over again. The first one, Galileo versus, you know, versus the church 500 years ago. And in the middle of the 20th century, you had the pseudo-scientific totalitarianisms of, of communism and, and national socialism uh, that, 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 that specifically claimed to be scientifically based. So what we're facing with now, what we're facing now isn't really new. It's, it's a continuation of something that's been happening for the past uh, 500 years at least. And, and frankly, um, the one subject, one issue that perhaps hasn't been mentioned is that um, the present uh, political situation of, of identity politics is really a, a reinvention of, of a medieval uh, uh, idea of a society of estates, a fixed society that can't be altered. And so it's really no, no surprise that we're getting, again, this, this tension between, between established received belief and, and scientific questioning. It's, it's implicit in, in, in present-day politics. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, Tracy, did Can you... I, yeah. about that, first, that first question, that first point about um, people asking questions about the science when they, they really want to have a discussion. The thing I, I just want to draw out, it's worth us all asking this of ourselves and trying to be honest about things. When we're reading something, to ask if our, our ability to believe it or to give it some credibility is going to be changed by the conclusion of it. You know, and I do think it's possible to hold an objection to something and just to accept that the science says otherwise. So, for example, I didn't want um, you know, evidence to emerge that masks were the absolutely fantastic panacea or, or, or were going to sort everything out for COVID. I was really... Um, I, I would have found that really difficult myself because I'd have to live with the consequences of that and I didn't want to live in a society where that was the case. However, if it had been the case... I would have had to live with it, you know, or at least I would have found my objection on some other basis and said, oh, to hell with the transmission or something, you know. But you have to be able, I think, to separate out those things and to say, look, sometimes things are not going to go my way. And I, for example, I really didn't want, as most people didn't want, to discover, contrary to what Toby says, that, you know, everyone wanted to exaggerate it, 
didn't want to discover that how transmissible it was, really didn't want to read another science paper that showed just you know, how tiny uh, the aerosol was that you needed to transmit that. You know, it would have been lovely to find um, that barriers were um, effective, but that wasn't the case. And you have to just come to terms with that and what that's going to mean in terms of public health intervention and think then about those bigger questions you've other, you and others have raised about, well, how do you trade that off with economic considerations and, and so on. But I, I think we, you know, I don't think that people are quite looking for the um, we're all going to hell in a handcart story as much as you think they are. Toby. I, mean, I, I think the, um, uh, the reason people were so willing to suspend their critical faculties when it came to the ability of the state to protect us from a virus, which on the face of it is clearly nonsense, any more than the state can affect the climate. I mean, it's a sort of, it's, 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 want, it's a kind of um, imagining that the state is far more powerful, far more able to protect us from nature, um, red in tooth and claw, than it really is. And politicians are happy to go along with that illusion because it makes them more powerful and preserves their power. Um, but I think um, insofar as people um, erred and, um, didn't, and suspended their critical faculties during that period, it was in ignoring the evidence that um, masks didn't work, that we couldn't really do anything to stop the transmission of the virus, and so on and so forth. Um, I think um, uh, I had a, a, yeah, as old as, the, as, as, as at least 500 years old, what's new about what's going on in science today? I think, I think there is something new about um, the scientific mob that targeted the seven letter writers in New Zealand, and in particular, the two members of the Royal Society of New Zealand. Um, you know, these scientists were, I mean, of course, we've seen many times before, um, dating back many hundreds of years, um, people in positions of authority invoking the infallibility of science to punish and excommunicate heretics. That isn't new. But what was new in this case is that people were, um, uh, many scientists were engaging in a kind of self-flagellation about science and um, wanted to kind of signal that they didn't think scientific knowledge was universal, transcended history and place, and was true in every place at every time, was objective. You know, they resisted that. They didn't want to make those elevated claims for science as a privileged way of understanding the world, but wanted to kind of abase themselves at the kind of altar of the woke church and, and claim, even though they probably didn't believe it, that the Maori way of understanding the world was just as valid and anyone who challenged that must be racist, xenophobic, some kind of white supremacist, an apologist for cishet normative patriarchy, etc. That's new, I think. Scientists self-flagellating in the public square to undermine science and almost as a way of preserving their authority. I mean, it's a weird paradox which a sociologist of science can perhaps explain. As a way of preserving the authority of science, denying science's authority over any other ways of understanding. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. When he was um, particularly exasperated with a line of criticism, Wolfgang Pauli would sometimes say, it's not even wrong. And what he meant by that was, they just hadn't got the question. It was a form of scepticism which was so ill-informed, he found it just frustrating to engage with. And I think we've got to be really careful you don't go down this road. I mean, on the climate, for example, Gavin Schmidt on real climate will just be so frustrated with some of the critics. He'll say, you really think we haven't thought of this point? We spent our entire professional lives looking at this topic and you really think some point you make about clouds is something we just haven't thought about. So that it, I think it was so... Care and the same goes for the COVID pandemic. We've had a situation in which many scientists in so many different areas looked at questions, debated for months and months and months and months, and now retrospectively are clawing over all the data. And unsurprisingly, they've reached a fairly strong consensus on some basic points, like 
the infection fatality rate being roughly 0.9%, say, which amazingly was what Ferguson said right at the beginning, and is phenomenally accurate given the crude data we had at the time. So I think it's weird to go around saying, make sweeping statements about a whole collection of professionals who've looked at something all their lives over four years and say they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, it's just not even wrong, as Tauli would say. And I think the same goes for policy to an extent, to be critical of what you were saying, John, um, and even Tracy to an extent. Um, if you look, for example, at the whole transmission debate, the first lockdown, it was a bit of a panic. People just, you know, you literally... Lockdown wasn't the policy until about the 14th of March at, you know, 9 a.m. or something. And then the government just started going into it. Obviously, they would suddenly realise it, it was going much faster than they thought. They had to slam the brakes on it. It was a bit of a panic. Pretty understandable. Then, of course, they had months and months and months and months to think about it. And it's quite interesting that some very informed critics of lockdown nevertheless came round to supporting the third national lockdown, the final national lockdown. Again, it was a slam the brakes on job. Um, same with schools. They tried to keep schools open. They kept them open in the autumn. They kept them open during the second national lockdown. They were made the absolute priority. And then, of course, when Alpha came along, SAGE, it was SAGE. It wasn't anybody. It wasn't I, SAGE. It wasn't Cranks. It was the main body looking at this said, yeah, yeah, schools are playing a role. Well, my point is... That's... Oh, oh, sorry, don't I'm, no need to be rude. I Thank thought you. I could have a critical go. Sorry. <laughs> um, so... I suppose it's like, almost like a psychological question. What motivates that kind of scepticism? Why not stick to the policy? I've debated many intelligent yeah, John, you're gonna have to... who are very happy just to debate policy and don't think they need to question the entire expertise of a whole collection of people. They're happy to think, fine, they've probably got that right. I'm going to go on the policy. What's this, why do you need to go into that level of scepticism that most people think is a bit cranky? Well, if it's similar, can you make it really short? <laughs> now you say it's different. You said it was similar to start okay, with. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, we've heard a lot about the science and um, about public policy. And I wonder whether we're close to the kind of C.P. Snow debate um, here between um, natural science and social science. And we were talking to a very, very senior uh, medical advisor to the government during the pandemic. And I said, was part of the problem there were so few natural scientists in public policy in government and this person said, no, the opposite is true. There aren't enough um, natural scientists who understand behaviour, how people actually operate in society. And I wonder if you'd have thought about that. Yeah, I'm really... Can I speak on this? Because I'm yeah. really wary of this. We always hear things like there aren't enough scientists in Parliament and stuff. I think you don't have to be um, a scientist to ask a critical question. You just need to ask a critical question. Um, but I, I welcome the challenge on, on this. And I, funnily enough, I'd actually wrote, written down the clouds thing as an example because I remember the exasperation of, yeah, there's going to be a million things we haven't thought of, but it won't be clouds. Um, and, uh, and I thought it was a great, um, it's a great example of that exasperation. There, there is, though, something fundamentally wrong with the way of arguing that doesn't work for science. Science doesn't work by, I see you, your paper, I, I raise you to. It doesn't work by, you know, in the sense of, um, I can just chuck something in that's called a peer-reviewed paper and you've got a peer-reviewed paper. It doesn't work by saying, you've got your expert, I've got mine. That's not how it works. It works by saying, what have you observed there? OK, how can I account for what you've observed you know, it, it, there's a building seriousness about it that I think we weren't seeing in the kind of what I would call like the throwaway, the rhetorical kind of um, uh, uh, use of science questioning during the, during the pandemic particularly, but we see it a lot around climate as well. So I don't think it's... Um, I don't know what the answer is to your question about what motivates that kind of scepticism, but it does seem to have emerged alongside people feeling like there aren't other routes in politics to express those things. Um, and that, you know, why wouldn't Toby stand for election? Why wouldn't you stand for election, Toby? Isn't that really how you should express I've yourself? Many times by the Tories this week. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, interestingly, I mean, the, 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 the were, there was a kind of coterie of behavioural scientists on SAGE. Um, and my friend Laura Dodsworth has written a book about their pernicious influence um, uh, in the early phase of the pandemic in terrifying everyone to comply with lockdown restrictions. I think she is exaggerating just how much behavioural science um, informed that kind of behavioural change on the part of the... I don't think it's very difficult to terrify people into staying in their homes. You know, um, if you tell them there's a deadly disease, 
at loose. Um, you don't have to be, and I think most, most behavioral science is, is pretty ropey. Um, uh, you know, a lot of it doesn't replicate. Um, it, um, uh, it's, its track record isn't fantastic. I think one of the reasons, um, you know, various ruling parties, uh, including the Tory party, uh, aren't doing very well and are facing electoral defeat um, uh, in various elections is because they've been over-reliant on the advice of behavioral scientists. This shonky science has informed a lot of the propaganda they've pumped out to defend their policies. Um, and it turns out it doesn't really work that well. Um, so they're about to find out that actually, you know, no one's been persuaded by being nudged that, uh, you know, what they've been promoting is actually true. Um, just to come back on what you said, um, it, was, it seemed like a kind of stay in your lane point. It was hard to tell whether you were actually saying that. But, um, uh, I mean, it's, I don't think we, I mean, I think it would be unreasonable to expect non-scientists, lay people, to just take what scientists say on faith and not challenge it because they don't have the expertise to do so. Um, I think it might be easier to, 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 to persuade people to stay in their lane like that if scientists didn't appear to be the ones with a public voice, the ones working with governments and bureaucracies, if they didn't appear to be all singing from the same left-wing hymn sheet. And that, if you're not left-wing, that naturally makes you quite suspicious. Um, uh, and I think the... The, um, you know, and in a lot of cases, I mean, the, 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 uh, the group that um, did the most to discredit um, the um, uh, uh, zoonotic theory about the origins of COVID-19, they were a bunch of lay people. And often the people challenging net zero um, are lay people, independent researchers, people who've kind of got up to speed, self-educated, not scientifically taught, but who've become scientifically literate and actually can make and have made an important contribution to these public debates. And I guess the last thing to say is that um, in The Daily Skeptic, at least, um, the people challenging the kind of prevailing scientific orthodoxy that policymakers are appealing to are often themselves heretical scientists who can't get published um, in mainstream scientific journals and who can't get a hearing in Downing Street. So they have no alternative but to set out their stall in kind of fringe publications like The Daily Skeptic. Um, and, but I think, you know, um, uh, it may well be that, that they turn out to be right about many things. Actually, I was going to just uh, get the mic to Paul. Uh, just, uh, just a couple of comments. I mean, uh, we were so uninformed with this new virus. The uh, initial health education posters and materials that came out was to do with an influ uh, the transmission of an influenza virus, not a coronavirus. Um, uh, the, uncertainty, the uncertainties at the beginning of the pandemic were very, very high. I remember talking to someone in WHO just before they went into... Um, recommendations about face masks. He said, Paul, we've got three systematic reviews on our table about whether face masks work, and they all say different things. We really don't know. And, and I think, so we do have to recognise there was a lot of scientific uncertainty. There was a lot of inferences and indirect evidence being used. And I think one of the things Tracy uh, pointed out re relates to the science uh, and then values and preferences and, and, and how it's important to separate these sometimes. And certainly in the WHO, although I have plenty of criticism for them, in their guideline process, they separate off the people uh, that are presenting and summarising the research evidence from the people making the decisions so that there's a separation of that process. In this country, it all gets mushed together. And I... I, I, I um, I, I, your, your talk about um, the politicians hiding behind the science is, is one that uh, I can recognise. But it, uh, this country sort of mushes it all together, which doesn't help and can, uh, creates some confusion in the, in, in the public. So that, that's just a comment, really, um, uh, rather than a question. But I think I, another reason not to trust the scientists um, to get these things right is that they often kind of change their minds on a sixpence, you know, Jenny Harry's initially saying, don't wear masks and the who, and then switching, you know, a day later, seemingly, you know, apropos of nothing, changing their minds and saying, we should wear masks. And I think it's wrong to say 
that scientists got the infection fatality rate right. I remember when the WHO put the IFR of COVID-19 above, above 3%. And I thought the consensus isn't that it's, isn't that it's 0 0.9, yeah, yeah, but it's somewhere yeah. between 0 0.15 and 0 0.2, i.e. no different from seasonal flu. Yeah, and it, we, we, we can't do this, okay? We can, you can come to the pub and have a conversation. So it's not going to work. Alan, did you want to say something? You sure? Okay. Um, we do need to wind up. So if anybody's got very quick, can you be quick? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really school marmish. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean it to sound like that. Just down here, thanks. Just quickly, have you, uh, Toby, considered the possibility that your, your use of emotive language undermines your case? It seems to me your, your line of attack is to accuse certain groups of being uh, exaggerators and then to state that they're left wing. Now, you've just said that the New Zealand scientists are self-flagellators. Um, are you not an exaggerator yourself? I think there's a difference between um, exaggerating how confident you are in a scientific hypothesis and using colourful language to kind of ridicule your opponents. That's one's a literary flourish, the other is fundamentally misleading. Say again. So earlier on, you said you had exaggerated things. So are you saying fundamentally misleading? No, I think I think we. Um, uh, I mean, I think we um, underestimated at the. I think I and other people in the kind of lockdown skeptics community um, exaggerated um, uh, how um, unvirulent the virus was and how likely it was to burn itself out and no. not come back in wave after wave. But I don't think that was, um, uh, we, were, we, we weren't, we weren't, we, I don't think Sorry, that was tracing. deliberate. There wasn't, there was, there was no kind of, um, there was no kind of malice behind it. We weren't, it wasn't disinformation. That was our best understanding at the time. Okay, it was different. Right. It was, and, it, 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 and though we got that wrong, I think people on the other side got many more things yeah. wrong. Yeah. So basically, if you haven't got the microphone, nobody at home can hear you, and that really annoys people. So we're not. Be, you're very welcome to stick around, go to the pub or whatever, and continue the conversation. It's, it's not about trying to close down a conflict. It's just trying to make it into a meeting where there's some degree of order. So a question here. Thank you. Um, I just want to go back to Tracy's point, which I think is a very valid one about separating out principles from scientific debate. And I think that the situation we were in is that we had fundamental principles that were overridden. The, pr the precautionary principle was inverted. We overrode informed consent and bodily autonomy. We, you know, children do not have a duty to protect adults. It's the other way around. So these principles were overridden. And people writing about these principles couldn't get published anywhere except in the Daily Skeptic. So you have Toby published articles about those principles being overridden. He also published articles, you know, from experts who were using observations, as you were saying, to challenge the orthodoxy, which is based on modelling, based on assumptions, because it's inevitably based on assumptions that weren't all evidence-based. And he also published articles that combined the two, because you inevitably do. So when you talk about your school's example, when, like, Toby was publishing about the fact that transmission in schools was not affected in different scenarios with, because children weren't particularly spreading it, then people would also include in that the principles about the harm it was causing to children. And it was right for them to do that. But the thing that's missing from this debate is what was happening on the other side of the argument. Because you've almost presented it as if the science didn't have a moral dimension. And it had a moral dimension throughout. Because the claim was, if, if we didn't do what we were told, we would kill granny. And that was always in the background of any of the scientific so debate. So why is that a scientific thing and not a policy thing? Because I recall that very much being the policy, right? And if you could name me where that's a scientific paper or a study, you know what I mean? It's not, is it? It's a policy. It's a policy. So what, what is, sorry? So, so you're talking about, what you're doing is you're wrapping up what became a government public health messaging comms campaign, right? And you're calling that the science, and you're putting it on that side called the science. I, I totally agree with your frustration. I really understand that what was a public health issue became a public order issue, as somebody very smartly put in 
publication at the time. I really understand the frustration with that. I also think that our ability as human beings with families and in communities to see the long effect, to see how teenage kids were responding, to think about the bigger effects of what was going on, was a lot more forward-sighted and meaningfully social than the discussions that were going on around the narrow transmission so dynamics in government. Can I just clarify government. a bit? My point is it's about the balance, right? If we're putting forward a scientific argument that doesn't have the moral dimension included, it will be slammed down by the moral, you're going to kill granny. So you have to put both. Right. But can we also have an aspiration? Because my question really is, I'm frustrated for you, Toby, is that you didn't really push the debate on very much, you know? And for all the effort that you put on and all the, all the public that you commanded, I feel that that was poor. I think you, there was perhaps one area where on the, on the um, lab leaks discussion where you actually shaped a bit of the discussion. I think taking people off to a fringe and, and just publishing... A, a range of things where you just lob in a sort of, an, oh, here's another person who did a science degree and has got their theory and they've written a book and they've got a thing, let's publish their paper. It doesn't push the debate on. I think we should have higher aspirations of asking more of the people in power and bring it to the door of them and ask to change how things are done. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I want I, to see I, how systems I, change, do things better. I think, um, well, just, just to go back to your response to Claire, it was slightly mystifying because... Of course, the moral argument was inextricably bound up with the scientific argument. I mean, that's why when um, we, were, we were being advised to stay in our homes, to not go to the NHS if we didn't have COVID and the rest of it on a daily basis from the kind of situation room at Downing Street with the kind of yellow and black tape on the podiums, it was Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance on either side of Boris often producing charts showing just how virulent the virus was and how we needed to stay home um, uh, in order to not kill granny. I mean, it was all kind of bound up together, so it was very difficult to challenge the moral dimension That's of the policy fair. without also challenging the scientific and, and dimension. But on your, on your second point, Tracy, um, I don't recognise that at all. I mean, rather, I, I, mean, I, I rather think that... Um, lockdown sceptics like me, who were in a tiny minority and were thought to be cranks at the beginning of 2020, have now basically won the argument in the public square. One, one, just, to, just to maybe bring it to a close, actually, because it is ten past nine. Uh, one of the things that I, th I think is an outstanding question, really, from the, the pandemic, but also what's happened since, is why is it that people get so angry at Toby and Daily Skeptic, and much more angry at some people get much more angry at Toby and Daily Skeptic than they do at policymakers. Because Toby wasn't making policy, he was challenging policy. So I do think it's quite uh, interesting that, that particularly people who identify very strongly with sci the science maybe have a, have a very, very kind of, um, but a very emotive reaction. I mean, I, I do think, it, I think it's genuinely interesting. I'm not, I'm not just saying that because he's my boss. Because <laughs> we disagreed many times. It's partly why I wanted to put this, um, this series of events together is because, uh, you know, I have uh, uh, taken issue with some of the things that um, has been a sceptic, but also that um, I also know that lots and lots of people have said to me, Daily Skeptic was the only thing that kept me sane in lockdown. Now, I think people who are critical of Toby and skeptics should take that really seriously because these were not mad people before lockdown. They were reasonable people. And they felt that lockdown itself was the thing that drove them slightly crazy. And they were looking for an alternative voice. And they didn't see it in the media, that's for sure. They certainly didn't see it on the BBC and any of the newspapers I was reading. So th that's why a daily bulletin became something that was incredibly important for people. And I think the onus is on people who are, you know, are kind of now aligned with, or whatever, whatever you're aligned with, is to actually address that question. What is it that people were looking for and that they felt that the need was met through a daily bulletin into their in inbox? Why, why was it that, that wasn't, there wasn't a public debate that was much more open that people felt that they could articulate their concerns through? Can I, can I say, in that sense, Jan, I do think, I, I, I think that's really reasonable and a great a role for, for you or anyone else to play. And I think in that sense, you could say you pushed things on, you had pushed the debate on. What I'm talking about is, is let's not have alt-science in this place. 
right? Let's actually, you know, I, that's why I don't think we got better science as a result of those discussions. I think we got better humanity as a result of the discussions that people needed to have about these wider effects, the longer term effects and the things that they objected to. And uh, so I think it's fine to have a conversation about people's different uh, differential experiences. You know, it was fine for young people to um, be in a, uh, a, a factory packing your Waitrose order cheap by jowl. It just wasn't fine to them being a rave and having a nice time. You know, there's all sorts of things that they came also did out. That. <laughs> um, but there's all sorts of things that came out of it that needed that, that, that you know that show that people had a very different lockdown a very different experience of the pandemic very different uh, impact on their families in terms of in, illness and, and other effects so so I think that there was a need for all of that humanity and consideration of, the, of, of wider life and that was a big enough job to do I just think we didn't need the old science because it didn't push science on um I think I can answer why um, I attracted so much hostility, but not just me, um, other prominent lockdown sceptics too, like Shanetra Gupta, Carl Hennigan, Jay Bhattacharya, Martin Kuldorf. Um, it's because the people who were angry with us were, for the most part, people who were complicit in the lockdown policy. They went along with it, they supported it, they advocated for it, they disapproved of, in some cases, dobbed in people who didn't comply with the restrictions. And as it became clear that all the harm that policy caused, not just to children, the fact that people couldn't be with their loved ones when they were dying but had to kind of comfort them via an iPad, um, the extraordinary waiting lists in the NHS, the fact that we had runaway inflation for two years, seemingly spunked 400 billion up the wall, wrecked the economy, um, uh, maybe heading towards bankruptcy as a consequence. I mean, all these harms, if, these, if, if, if there are these people popping up and saying they were completely unnecessary, that was an own goal, self-inflicted harm, there were no benefits or very, very few benefits. Um, uh, and, you know, you got it wrong and you have to bear some responsibility for causing all this unnecessary harm. Of course, they're not going to like that message. Yeah, it's just a question of who the they is, though, isn't it? Because, um, yeah, um, I mean, it, what what is very evident from this session <laughs> is that there's a huge untapped discussion still to be had, which is a reckoning about uh, how we dealt with the pandemic. And um, I think I thought we might be able to cover lots of things, but clearly it's just the thing that keeps on coming back. And it, 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 we haven't had a way of, of discussing it. I mean, the, people's faith in the in, the inquiry is minimal. Um, so clearly it's, it's still there and we've kind of, we forget, try and forget about it because it was just, I think Kathleen Stocks made this point, that it was so horrific that we forgot, whichever way you came at it, um, that people have sort of memory hold it, but then every now and then it comes back. <laughs> and then you, uh, it's quite shocking actually when you I, remember. I, I, if I could say just one last thing, I think one of the, um, uh, one of the things I regard as um, a positive legacy of the pandemic is that I think it left a lot of people much more skeptical about scientific modeling than they were beforehand. I mean, they, they, they saw with their own eyes that the modelers just kept getting it wrong, kept exaggerating the risk. Um, and, and I think that's made them more skeptical about the modeling underpinning policies like net zero and alarmist messages about climate change. So I think that has been a positive legacy of um, the kind of scepticism people like me and other lockdown sceptics injected into the kind of scientific debate. I think you need to be incredibly careful about a situation where you had politicians who were completely unable. I mean, we, we really had politicians who were so out of their depth on using some of those tools of scientific thinking and, and calculation. And as a result, you had a massive exaggeration of all oh, the boffins have got control of this. So I think a really big sort of hiding behind the science. Um, and people who were unable to ask penetrating questions about those. Um, uh, so we had sort of, sort of ah reactions every time someone finally sort of understood a set of figures. Um, but we need to be really careful that, the, the, you know, to, like anything, like any tool, modelling has a very important place when we want to look at the interplay of factors and all sorts of other questions, using them as sort of prediction tools, uh, as was happening when they were rolled out in the press, and I think was understood by many spads and politicians uh, in that way. 
uh, was, was just uh, hiding to nothing, uh, inevitably going to lead to silly um, uh, reports. And so, so I, do, I think there is all sorts of things that have been brought out by the pandemic. And perhaps the question for us is, do we expect to encounter these again? You know, um, is it some of these things just a one-off and a weirdness of what happened there? Um, and I do think there are some things that, that we can learn from it. And one of the things we should learn from it is the importance of exposing the discussions that are about facts and about values. I mean, which is a crass way of putting it, but, you know, the testable, the pollable questions. Because I'm sure that that has much more chance of delivering all of us the discussions we need and the space to debate them, whether it's the scientific space um, to, to advance our thinking and criticise openly without people sort of warring and taking these things as totems um, of, their, of their each side, uh, or whether it's the public space we need to articulate how we want society to be. I think we can, we can end up taking a step much closer to that if we can be clearer about those things and more honest about those things. OK, on that note, <laughs> we'll finally uh, end. So thank you to all of those who, who joined online and thank you all, those of you in the room, uh, thanks for coming. I'm sure it's a very mixed audience and obviously very mixed views, but that's, that's exactly the point of uh, Free Speech Union events. So in fact, it's unusual to have so much disagreement, so it's yeah. quite refreshing, actually. <laughs> so um, we have an event which is looking at the free speech lessons that we ought to learn from the CAS review coming up on the 9th of July, and that's taking place in London and also online. Uh, all the details are on the Free Speech Union's website, and we've got, speaking at that, Professor Michael Biggs, who Toby spoke about earlier, Sue Evans, who was the first whistleblower from the Tavistock Clinic, um, David Bell, obviously a later uh, whistleblower, uh, Michelle Moore, who's an educational uh, and uh, specialist in children with developmental problems, and Stephanie Davis arrived from Transgender Trends. So uh, that is going to be a really, really excellent panel with lots of opportunity for people to ask questions, and it's going to be a big event, but tickets are selling fast, so do book your place early, whether that's online or, um, or in person. So go to our website, and on our website you'll also find information about joining the Free Speech Union as well. So that's freespeechunion.org. So thanks again to Toby and Tracy. Thank you to you for all your questions, and thanks very much. Thank you.